Insane. I'm Todd Zwillick, and this is Breaking the Vote. Here's a hard fact. Something around 35% of Americans believe that Joe Biden wasn't legitimately elected president. Make that universe just Republicans, and the number is closer to 70%. After the election of 2020, after all the failed court cases, after the attempted coup, and possible criminal charges right around the corner, still, seven out of 10 people you meet who call- The Hasanabi Doctrine is still alive and well, boys. You can get 30% of Americans to say they believe in anything. Themselves a Republican think the election was stolen. There's never been any real evidence for it. It's hard to get your head around the idea that the lies of one man have permeated the culture so deeply, but it's a fact that we can't ignore if we want to get out of this mess. It's tempting to pin all of this on Trump, but in reality, the problem of authoritarianism, conspiracy theories, and political violence go way, way deeper than him. Trust in institutions of democracy was already shaky before Donald Trump started kicking the legs out. Community spaces of common ground were already going by the wayside and getting replaced by political identity. The internet was already helping divide and sort us with algorithms that make outrage and division a lot more profitable than goodwill. And here's a hard fact. Shifting demographics and cultural standards were already making many white Americans feel threatened long before Donald Trump played to their fears like a maestro. So where do we go from here? That's what we want to explore in this last episode of this season of Breaking the Vote. We'll go to Italy for a reality check on a democratic country taking a hard right turn that reminds too many people of a dark history. An expert on how democracies thrive joins us to talk about what we can do to make things better. And a bunch of my colleagues here at Vice get together to try to hash it all out ahead of next week's midterms. But first, Alexis Johnson takes us to Pennsylvania, where one candidate is trying to get elected governor by turning voters into Christian soldiers. Events like this usually aren't a big part of Doug Mastriano's campaign, but neither are TV ads, talking to press, or building relationships with other Republicans. He first built a following online with constant election denialism after Trump's loss in 2020. I pray for the leaders also in, in the federal government, God, on the 6th of January, that they will rise up with boldness. You'll bless these <laughs> letters that President Trump asked. Yo, that's why I'm saying, by the way, this guy is like running for governor, right, <clears throat> of Pennsylvania. And I need you to understand, like, this motherfucker is a ride or die, okay? Like, this dude is the real deal, okay? The genuine, true psycho, okay? I mean, he is fucking so insane, bro. The fact that he is anywhere near close. Like, he's not even close in the polls, but, like, the fact that he's even up there is terrifying. Is a terrifying prospect for the future of the United States of America, okay? Like, he's like four points or, or four to six points uh, uh, away from defeating Josh Shapiro. Obviously, Shapiro is like a lot more reasonable. I just cannot, I cannot comprehend a world in which like there's only a fucking 10 point swing between these motherfuckers. It blows my mind. This morning, the sent to Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy outlining the fraud in Pennsylvania. Mastriano is pretty aligned with all the other Trump loyalists across the country running for office this year. He even spent campaign funds to charter buses to the January 6th insurrection. The difference is that Mastriano is running for the governor of Pennsylvania, one of the most powerful seats in the country, because whoever holds it can rewrite the state's voting laws and appoint a secretary of state who can deny election outcomes. And despite Mastriano's elusive campaign strategies, he seems to have built a devoted fan base. Why do you think Doug Mastrano would make a good governor for Pennsylvanians specifically? Because he was right from the get-go. The COVID, the shots, the vaccines, the shutdown, the way they destroyed our economy. Doug would have never done none of that. 
And I like that he is a, just an honest Christian guy. I, I really believe that I can. The thing that frustrates me about the Pied Piper strategy that Democrats have been impl um, that uh, have been using is the long-term consequences of it, okay? This is what happened with Doug Mastriano as well. Democrats identified that he's a fucking absolute psychopath and pumped him, okay? They used funds on the Doug Mastriano campaign so that he would, um, he would be the Republican candidate. Now, what is really fucked up, and same with Dan Cox in Maryland, yes, but what is really fucked up about this is that you're still amplifying and promoting an absolute psychopath. You're legitimizing an absolute psychopath. So even if it backfires on, well, it doesn't backfire, let's say, in this circumstance with Dan Cox, it doesn't backfire in this circumstance with, with uh, Mastriano, you're still, you've still fucked yourself because you radicalized more fucking psychos in the Republican base of voters. You're giving them way too much attention. I'm giving the fucking gubernatorial, like, person who's running for governor in Pennsylvania too much attention four days out of a fucking... What the fuck? It's four days out of a fucking midterm election. He said, why are you platforming Doug Mastriano? No, I'm at the Pied, uh, Piper campaigners law. No, that's not. It's, it's actually legitimately a problem. Can uh, trust him to do the right thing by Pennsylvanians. He's honest, he's trustworthy, and I believe that he has a lot of values that align with my values. Mastriano takes the old political cliche of fighting for the soul of the nation pretty literally. He depicts Democrats who support abortion, climate change intervention, or LGBTQ rights as satanic. Even his campaign slogan is just a quote from the Bible. So the slogan is, walk as free people. Correct. Why do you resonate with that? Uh, because that is what our liberties, especially being from Pennsylvania, is founded on. You know, this is the Keystone State. You know, we were founded on things like religious freedom with William Penn, and that resonates with me. And so far, only Doug Mastriano. We were founded on, you know, secular values, religious freedom, as in like freedom from religion or freedom to freedom to believe whatever fucking religion you want to believe in. That doesn't mean you're just a, a, a hyper Christian. That doesn't mean freedom for Christianity to thrive um, while, while all other religions get suppressed, okay? What the fuck? You know, fought for that. There's a name for this type of thinking. Christian nationalism. The belief that America is a Christian nation and the government should take any step to keep it that way. Even though it's become much more popular in the last few years, this ideology has a long history. So when it comes to Christian nationalism, how would you describe that? Some of the, what we've seen among Christian nationalists who are running for political office is they describe politics as spiritual warfare. Uh, they might describe their political campaign as a kind of military battle. Um, so there's this kind of connection between violence and, and Christianity. Doug Mastriano, for example, went to this Jericho march. Jericho was one of the cities that was part of the Canaanite conquest in the Hebrew Bible. This is literally language about killing people. And we don't know when those metaphors will incite actual violence. In recent months, there have been several reports of Mastriano's ties with Gab, the anti-Semitic and conspiracy-ridden social network. That's the site where the shooter at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh yep. laid out his plans. Yep. And Gab's CEO regularly pushes conspiracies like the Great Replacement Theory. If he were to win, you know, what's at stake, what's at risk when those kinds of beliefs um, bleed into policy and how he can really change people's lives. Mm -hmm. So there's this language of freedom, but at the same time, he wants to limit women's rights. He wants to limit gay and trans rights. He wants to limit how people can vote, right? So he wants to limit voters' rights. 
Um, and he has wanted to pass even some le legislation where the Bible is taught in schools, um, which is a kind of form of Christian privilege, which would limit other people's religious rights. Mastriano has rejected the Republicans claim that they love free speech, and yet they literally run on banning LGBT books. They run on <clears throat> banning leftist books. They run on eliminating what they call to be CRT, which is a true accounting of black history in this country. Okay? They run on religious freedom, but absolutely throb at the idea of being able to suppress other religious uh, opinions. These people are not... that. See, look, look, look. That's not free speech. That's propaganda. I mean, I know you're just memeing. But that is what they say. But CRT is dangerous and insane. Why? Explain to me what you think CRT is and then tell me why you think it's dangerous and insane. Necromancy, you d you identified exactly why I'm so frustrated with the Pied Piper shit. The Pied Piper strategy unironically radicalized millions of Republicans from mainstream races to outright violent Christo fascists, and that radicalization far outlasts one election cycle, even if the candidate loses this time, which they often don't. And then, even then, fascism gains momentum after momentum. Yes. Oh, shit, I'm on the spot. Yeah. Tell me what CRT is, and then explain to me why it's bad. It literally promotes intolerance. No, you didn't answer my question. What is CRT? Go ahead. We're waiting. The whole class is waiting. Come on, stop trying to Google, bro. Just write your thoughts, brother. You take the worst part of Marx's theory, which I like. Stop. Stop responding to shit that I didn't ask you. Explain. By the way, it's not shocking to me that a uh, person who considers themselves to be a leftist from, Quebecois, uh, from Quebec is, is uh, taking issue with CRT because they've been They've been, uh, you know, brain broken into thinking that if something is not. But anyway, CRT and the way that they describe it in academia and CRT and the way that like Republicans describe it is two entirely separate things. Okay. Critical race theory in, in law school is entirely specific and very different than what Republicans consider to be CRT. CRT for Republicans is like in elementary school and in, uh, in, in you know, K through 12. Educating children on the truth about racism, chattel slavery, and its implications. That's it. It is literally correcting the record that has been whitewashed by organizations like the white supremacist Daughters of the Confederacy group. Okay? That's it. The short and sweet of it is, by the way, I'm in political science. Well, it doesn't matter. It didn't take. Keep learning. Okay? Keep reading. Anyway, the best way to describe uh, the best way to describe it is like if you talk about slavery, when mentioning slavery and the founding fathers and the abolition of slavery, if you ever account for the perspective of black people as human beings and not just simply slaves, you're doing what Republicans consider to be uh, CRT. 
Normally, the argument around slavery, uh, especially during the founders in American schools, is completely devoid of the perspective of the black individuals that were enslaved. That's why the only time you learn about the founding fathers uh, and their opinions on slavery, you hear about it as a, as a matter of robust discussion amongst the founding fathers. Or you hear about concepts such as, it was just the way things were back then. Okay, well, we're not back then. We're right now. And we know right now that black perspectives at that time were still relevant because we know now in 2022 that those black people weren't animals. They weren't just, you know, commerce. They were human beings. So why are you making it seem like it's 1776? And even then, if there was robust discussion around it, why are you one of the fucking racists in that robust discussion? the label of Christian nationalists. But other Trump acolytes with similar views have embraced it. There are anti-Trump Republicans who have had enough of GOP nominees mimicking the former president. And they're actively working to make sure candidates like Mastriano lose. So we're about to meet with a guy named Craig Snyder, who is a longtime member of the GOP here in Pennsylvania, but has been actively working to get Republican voters to vote against Doug Mastriano in the midterms. We've specifically uh, targeted uh, about 250,000 registered voters, likely voters, people who regularly vote in elections, um, who are either Republicans or Republican-leaning independent voters, um, who we believe want to preserve democracy. They don't want uh, what Mastriano represents, and we think they're going to cross over and, and split tickets. If we can get uh, a, a reasonable number, and I, and I believe we will, uh, of Republicans no shot. This is just a money-making operation. You might as well just call it a money laundering front. No fucking shot. Look, man, those people don't give a shit about like some might care. Some New York Times reading conservatives might care, but ultimately they're going to be voting along the same boundaries for the same exact fucking reasons that the dumbass not rich um, everyday Joe Schmo Republican voters vote for. Okay, these guys are not reasonable. They're going to say, you know, I really wanted to vote for the Democratic Party because the Republican Party's gone too far with this election denial. But I do think that the Democrats are grooming children. So I think I'm going to still have to vote for the Republican Party, especially because I think that they're going to fix the economy. We can't leave the economy in the hands of the Democrats. Look what they've done so far. What we need right now is uh, reason and a uh, center, a smart center. You know, the White House can be Democrat. Uh, the Senate and House need to be Republican so we can finally bring the change necessary to fix the economy. Except, no, it won't. But that is precisely what uh, those guys vote as. To, tick, to split their tickets in this race, uh, I think we can determine the outcome and make sure uh, that uh, Mastriano is defeated and that Josh Shapiro is the next governor of the state. Did you ever think in 2022 that you would be actively campaigning for a Democratic governor? Uh, no. I mean, the short answer is no. I thought the Republican Party could be uh, uh, salvaged, could be improved. But when you get to this point where the nominee is somebody as extreme uh, as Mastriano is, uh, not only on election integrity issues, but really across the board, um, I, I think you got to take a stand. Uh, I say to people all the time, if you get invited to a banquet and they tell you you're going to pick chicken or fish, uh, and you might want pasta, but it's not, they're not serving it. So you got to pick one or the other. And in this case, um, you know. I love that, like, this guy's fucking normal analogy analogies what are they you know oftentimes real life experiences that make it easier for people to understand a current predicament right his analogy revolves around a fucking banquet dude you know when you go to a seven thousand dollar a plate dinner like a fundraiser for an oil baron uh 
who's running a, a fundraiser for the, um, you know, the, the Republican majority to murder uh, trans teenagers coalition. You know, when you go there at, at that banquet and they offer you only two choices, caviar and caviar plus uh, hors d'oeuvres, you know, that kind of thing. Like, dude, just say airplane. Everybody travels. Just say a wedding or an airplane. Motherfucker said banquet. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, Mastriano is the fish that's... The not everyone travels. Not even everyone travels via plane. I know, but that's still infinitely more normal than motherfucking banquet hall, dude. He said, you know, when you go to a banquet hall, that's crazy. That's rotten and stinks. And you got to pick the chicken. And that's, that's Josh Shapiro. <laughs> They don't want to talk about how they want to deem any parent who has a strong opinion about their child's education. I guess if Saad chooses Democrat law. ...is domestic terrorists. <laughs> yep. Yes, bro. I think the person that just said your child's education is being run by domestic terrorists or whatever the fuck is just, you know, that, that guy, I don't think is a good guy. Yep. Strange times we live in. They don't want to talk about the shutdown. They want you to forget about the COVID mandates, the forced masking of your kids. They don't want to talk about how they did everything they could to blunt our questions into voting integrity. I think that the Republican Party still doesn't realize how radicalized their base has become under Donald Trump. Sarah Longwell's job involves regularly polling voters in Pennsylvania. It's possible that what Doug Mastriano is doing is he doesn't really think he can win a general election, but he thinks he can become kind of a local uh, celebrity, somebody that the base, you know, uh, looks to for leadership. And that's a lot of this Republican Party now. There's people who can own sections of the base by being more and more extreme. Um, and then they can still have uh, political power in a state. It's possible Mastriano's views are too extreme even for Trump lovers. He's not polling well and hasn't raised much money. But anybody who witnessed Trump's surprise win in Pennsylvania in 2016 knows better than to count Mastriano out. We talked about his lack of kind of public ad campaigns, but how he does attract the base on social media through Facebook. Um, does that give you any fear? Are you nervous that this kind of silent base that he's building is going to end up popping up um, in November? Hey, look, one of the things that Donald Trump showed us is that the polls are missing a lot of voters. And so it's very hard to predict turnout for a candidate like this. I'm from Pennsylvania. I think I know that there are voters that exist uh, who would find Doug Mastriano attractive. I would like to think that that is not a majority of voters in Pennsylvania, but there's always this question of, you know, have these people participated in elections before? Do Are they showing up in polling and just not being sure and, and wondering if there is this red wave uh, in 2022 that there's going to be all these people that you didn't expect to see turning out and voting for Doug Mastriano. From Pennsylvania to Rome, when we come back, we head to Italy, where the country's newest far-right leader is freaking out Democratic heads across Europe as she celebrates her win and her fond memories of the country's fascist past. Miss Melania, are you trying to bring fascism back to Italy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this shit because uh, I think it's padding. It's filler. It's a filler episode. Like, we saw, we saw all that already. And nobody should be able to stand in the way of that. And we've seen in many countries around the world, from Hungary... Thank you, Rishi Vaz, for the tank of the to subs. ...Turkey to Venezuela. Uh, how easily that can allow governments to concentrate power in their own hands and make it very difficult to remove a democratically elected government from office by democratic means. It's pretty easy, I think, to identify some of the anti-democratic depredations of the right, embracing political violence, undermining elections. Pretty easy to spot if you look for it, but you've also- 
You put Venezuela on the same list as Hungary and Turkey? Yes, because that's liberalism, okay? Liberalism dictates that if you're authoritarian, you're all the same. But of course, liberal capitalist countries are authoritarian as well, but that kind of authoritarian is allowed because they're liberals. So written that the American left is doing things that are undermining democracy as well. What are some of those things? I think there are two things that I worry about. Uh, the first is simply an electoral strategy, right? When you have a two-party system, uh, it's really important that Democrats uh, stand on a message which can actually win. Um, you know, Donald Trump is not that popular when you look at the polls, and yet he came very close to being re-elected in 2020, and he may very well win the elections in 2024. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is it but a majority of Americans aren't voting for the Democratic Party. Why is the Democratic Party not able to seize on the extremism and the unpopularity of the Republican Party? And I think part of the answer is that on some important social... Nereden geliyor bu orospu çocukları ya? Nereden geliyor bu orospu dölleri? Hasan, geylerin Müslüman oldukları için kötü olduğunu söyleyenler hakkında ne düşünüyorsun? Amına koyayım onların. <gülüyor> Speak English. Oh my God. Insanity. On cultural issues, the Democratic Party is also out of the uh, mainstream of uh, American public opinion. Uh, the second thing I would say is that there are some strands of the left that are very critical of core liberal values, like uh, like free speech, um, uh, and, and that has me somewhat concerned as well. But certainly in America today, uh, the threat from Donald Trump and the MAGA movement is much more serious than those threats from the left. I don't know if you're a betting man or not, but would you bet on American democracy right now going into 2024? There's a very serious risk of democracy failing in 2024 or 2028 or sometime after that or sometime in between. Um, but that's not the most likely scenario. Perhaps it's only 20% likelihood. Most likely in one way or another, we will manage to get through this and our democracy will survive. But it also obviously means that we need to take a 20-25% of a chance of a really bad outcome very, very seriously. Because even though it might be more likely than not that American democracy survives, the fact that there is a plausible likelihood of it failing should alarm all of us. So let's get productive for us. What can we do right now, those of us who participate in politics in one way or the other as, as Americans, to see our way through to the other side here? I would say three things. The first is that we need to fight against the structural drivers of the rise of this discontent, of the rise of this public. I can't watch this liberalism uh, talk undermining <clears throat> how dangerous fascism is and not offering the legitimate reasons as to why uh, or how you could fight against fascism. Welcome back to Breaking. That's why I said it was a filler episode. In the vote. Enforcing good ethics is a tough job in any organization. Now imagine that your job is to enforce good ethics in the Trump administration. You ever try writing a speeding ticket to Vin Diesel? You get the picture. Walter oh! Schaub until he had to walk away from the Office of Government Ethics after just six months. In also, I'm supposed to be playing It Takes Two. The first part of the It Takes Two saga is supposed to be happening soon with Carl Jacobs. I don't know where Carl Jacobs is though. 2017. Now Schaub is an ethics watchdog, and he has some thoughts on how contempt for the rules is endangering democracy. Walter Schaub is the former director of the Federal Office of Government Ethics. He's currently a senior fellow at the Project on Government Oversight, otherwise known as POGO. Walter, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So Walter, we spend a lot of time around here talking about undermining elections, promotion of violence, some of the worst aspects of authoritarian Trumpism, but where do you see the biggest damage now to institutions in America from anti-democratic Trumpism? You know, I think the biggest damage is to public confidence, which sounds perhaps like an abstract or small thing, but the assault really is on all three branches of government and it's pretty severe at all levels. So you look at the consequence, it's a public that has less faith in the capacity of democracy to produce a government that represents all of us. And where that's a danger is that it could suppress people's willingness to come out and vote or otherwise participate in government. 
you know, unlike a lot of other forms of government, democracy actually depends on kind of an idealistic, optimistic viewpoint of the effectiveness of their government. And when that's taken away, the entire thing can fall into crisis pretty easily. You know, it makes a lot of sense to cover the big stories of corruption, January 6th and the coup attempt, diverting millions in Secret Service money to your private hotel business. I mean, those are big, sexy news stories. They're corrupt and they make a lot of sense. But, you know, I feel like when we do that, we sort of miss a lot of the more insidious corruption that's bleeding through the system right now. I mean, what are we missing? Yeah, you know, years and years ago in the early 2000s, there was an international group that was doing a review of anti-corruption mechanisms in the U.S. And they had a draft report in which they were going to recommend real concerns about the lack of independence of prosecutors, the fact that federal prosecutors report to political appointees who report to the president. And of course, that's so baked into our system, there wouldn't be much we could do about it. But I remember State Department and the Office of Government Ethics and DOJ and other agencies kind of poo-pooed that and talked them into really watering it down to a point where, where I looked at the report afterwards and you would have to know what they were referring to to even get what they were doing. But then you see Trump weaponizing the Department of Justice and Bill Barr's team looking for ways to prosecute political enemies and refusing to take action to enforce laws against the current president at the time. And even now, when we have a new president, we have a Department of Justice where the jury's out on whether they're going to have the nerve to hold senior federal officials accountable, including the former president, because they have sort of an institutional interest in not rocking the boat and a reluctance to look into things in some cases because it would be embarrassing to DOJ itself. They were culpable. Even Merrick Garland fought against the release of a memo in which the Department of Justice's infamous Office of Legal Counsel wrote a memo to Bill Barr coaching him on how to lie to the public about the Mueller investigation's findings. And obviously, there's great inequality in our legal system, but they didn't think that it would be marshaled in favor of a political candidate or against one. But I don't think we can have confidence that um, another authoritarian administration wouldn't use DOJ as one of its primary weapons against its opponents. Well, let me ask you about another institution, the Congress. What's the I watched the Clipper video already, chat. of high-profile members of Congress, people like Kevin McCarthy, Scott Perry, Jim Jordan, some of them household names, in this case, Republicans, who were either witnesses to January 6th, in some cases, even participants in the coup plot, really facing no accountability or even refusing to talk to the January 6th committee. So I'll have to admit I'm, I'm not up to speed on the specific conduct of the individuals you, you mentioned, but we saw, for instance, Josh Hawley standing out there raising his fist, egging on the terrorists. It colors the investigation because you're going after people who are the ones who burst into the building, the, the foot soldiers, so to speak. And they themselves are saying they were egged on by the former president. And some of them got tours of the building by members of Congress immediately before the attack. And so it Marjorie Taylor Green. raises uh -huh. questions about how serious you are. Weird cough I have. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Green. about going after those responsible for this. And yeah, I mean, the damage is incalculable. I, I can't even begin to, to put into words how dangerous it is that people who may have, or at least have created the suspicion that they may have, uh, participated in some aspect of this attack are not even not being held accountable, but are don't even appear to be under investigation and certainly are not under public Alarm questioning. Uh, Tom Cotton. <laughs> it, it goes to show the extent to which we're in danger of really losing democracy. And, and I've often said that I feel like January 6th was the dry run. I think there's a real danger that after the election in 2024 and early 2025, we could see violence on a scale that would make January 6th look like a picnic. And 
and we'll make January 6th like, look like the top of the hour ad break, okay? Because at the top of the hour, there's a six-second ad break. And if you've never seen violence, this is the most violent thing you're going to encounter. Unless you defend yourself against that top of the hour ad break by subscribing for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. By connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Use it on your favorite broadcaster. Uh, hopefully that's me. Or uh, you can just get gifted. The joke is just like so fucking... It's just the same exact like dumb dad joke that Elon Musk makes all the fucking time. Thought of it as, you know, being in the fringe. We thought of the Buffalo shooter, Pittsburgh, Escondido, El Paso. We've now seen it slowly become mainstream. We hear J.D. Vance. We hear Blake Masters. We hear all these like white Republicans. And then suddenly you go to the border and you start hearing Latinos and some Latino candidates say the same thing. There's nothing more powerful, and I feel like we've all seen that, than I think, no, the politics of grievance, right? There's nothing easier than being able to, to blame the other for something you don't have. And I think that's true with white folks, but I think it's, it's also true we're seeing with Latino voters, right? The moment that you can say, look, I want to be just like them, and those immigrants that are invading my country are taking something away from me. I mean, Ben, you report on the fringes of all of this because you report on the extreme of the extreme. Mm -hmm. um, literally Nazi cells across America, <laughs> extremism in the military. Um, and here you are with like the political cabal of Vice News. <laughs> like you're at the table now, yeah, which well, is weird. Like when I got into journalism, the idea of an extremism desk didn't exist, nor was this really a beat. And now I think it's, you know, Vice has a, has a great extremism desk, but a lot of publications have them because you need them because it's happening everywhere. I remember seeing stuff about great replacement theory, which has this you know, convoluted history among neo-Nazis in like chat groups with the base, which is this very hardcore neo-Nazi terror group. And to see that now being used as being name checked on Tucker Carlson, which is the most popular TV show or nightly TV show in America, it, it, to me, it was just sort of like this wild moment. And that was literally three and a half years, I think, from when I first saw it to now seeing it be front and center in American politics. On the other hand, though, there, there is the truth of the changing demographics of the United States, which is to say the electorate is changing and has been changing for decades now. Um, so I, what I find interesting about the Great Replacements Theory is that it gives, it imputes an intent and motive on a phenomenon that's effectively because America is a great place to come to for many people. There's different types of this, right? I mean, there's the academic version. As a, as a libertarian right there, Michael Moynihan, big libertarian guy, just remember that. Version that used to be the changing demographics, because the initial idea of this is if you populate the country with particularly Hispanic immigrants, it is going to be a big wave for Democrats, right? And of course, when you group people in as Hispanic or whatever you'd like to say, it doesn't look for any variation between people. You go to the border, people say, you know, Tejanos who have been there two, three generations, and they're like, oh my God, we, uh, Hondurans, no, 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 no. Nicaraguans, no, no, no. And then there are people that come from New York and say, Hispanics, and like, no, 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 there's, there's gradations. And then at the top of this, you have people who are becoming very conservative. It's actually defeating this idea that if Hispanics come, they will just be Democrats. I'm not so much worried about the politicians, it's, it's the people, right? It's, it's, this is why they are where they are because they're affecting. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. He, he, he did the Cato Institute uh, argument, which is correct. And that is that Hispanics are not a monolith. Latinos are not a monolith. They're not a monolithic voting block in general. And that is what the Cato Institute also correctly identifies because they are the last remaining like open borders libertarian think tank, even though they're massively far right, obviously. Um, he, he's saying that, and what he's saying is correct. He's saying that by the third generation, Latino voters and Latino uh, populations have completely assimilated to American culture. They do not see themselves as like Latino heritage. They understand that they have Latino heritage, but we'll usually just say that they're American and they are by all, uh, by all metrics available to us to understand whether someone is an American or not American. Okay. Like completely by the second generation, they've already assimilated uh, as well. 
But by the third generation, it's over. And there are third generation, you know, Chinese people in here. There are third generation Vietnamese people in here. There are third generation Mexican people in here. And half of you motherfuckers don't speak, or most of you motherfuckers don't speak uh, uh, Spanish or Chinese or Korean or Vietnamese. You know what I mean? You don't because you're literally straight up. You are literally straight the fuck up, third gen. You're an American, you know? Anyway, 20 days fasted, Mel B on red outfit. What the fuck? I don't even know what that means. Shut the fuck up. I'm third generation Italian and I'll always be Italian. Good luck with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm third generation Italian and I'll always be Italian. Motherfucker. Second generation Italians don't even speak Italian. You need to, if, you need to, if you need to use Duolingo to learn about your fucking heritage, you are no longer him. Okay. You are not Italian. Don't come to me with this shit. Don't come to me and be like, nah, man. Bro, I see this in my own fucking personal existence, okay? I have lived in the United States of America for more than 10 years now, okay? I grew up in Turkey, 18 years of my life. The most formative years of my life, I lived in Turkey. I am virtually indistinguishable from an American citizen now, okay? I see myself and my attitude towards certain things changing. Especially in a future where like a lot of people watch American television, like the next generation. If you go to that's why when you, when we went to Amsterdam and I and I talked to people there, they had literal straight up American accents. Why? Because they watched dubbed English movies growing up. They are so tuned into American culture. It's pretty much impossible to avoid or escape American culture at this point. Unless you're directly from the third world. And even then, there are still plenty of remnants of American imperialism, American cultural imperialism there. 